Hello, I'm Sami Zaydan. This is Counting the Cost and Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week... We have a clear plan of if such a situation, if it happened, how we're going to deal with it immediately, within hours. Qatar's economy minister explains how the government is keeping the country running in the face of the regional embargo. Also ahead, Qatar Airways says the blockade will hurt its bottom line in the near term, but the carrier sees opportunities to expand into other untapped markets. Plus... I'm Ella Callan in Berlin, where travellers from across the EU are benefiting from the end of mobile phone roaming charges. Well, Qatar may have been isolated economically by its Gulf neighbours, but its financial markets have stabilised after an initial week of losses. The government says it has the resources to cope with the regional sanctions. And the finance minister is warning if Qatar loses money, countries behind the embargo will lose money too. Credit rating agency Standard & Poor's says Qatari banks are strong enough to hold on, even if all Gulf money is pulled and more. And it's not just Qatari banks. The UAE's main lenders could lose out from a slowdown in business coming from Qatar. Qatar says gas exports, its top export earner, are on track, though importers are expected to push for sweeter deals. These gas supplies matter for the UAE too. The undersea Dolphin Energy Agency supplies the UAE and Oman with about 56 million cubic metres of Qatari gas a day. It's still operating despite diplomatic tension. As for food supplies, Turkey and Iran are benefiting at the expense of Saudi Arabia and the UAE. Indian and European companies are expected to step in too with sugar. Now for construction materials, Qatar says its supply chains are already in place. There's uncertainty though over the operations of UAE-based companies and contractors in Qatar. Qatar's economy minister Ahmed bin Jassim Al Thani says the government is already proving it can keep the country running. He's been speaking to Al Jazeera's Jamal Shayal. Let's start with talking about the day-to-day -day life of normal citizens here in Qatar, both Qataris and expats who are living here. What impact has this siege had on them? Yeah, when you talk about uh, the impact, uh, if we look at the Qatar economy, Qatar economy is uh, strong, resilient. Uh, all the indicators talk about like Qatar economy is the 18th most competitive in the world, the second micro economic efficiency and uh, good efficiency. Uh, uh, so uh, the indicator, a uh, very strong uh, financial uh, uh, position for Qatar. Qatar is one of the strongest economy in the world. Um, looking at the diversification of the economy of Qatar, 61% of GDP come from non-oil and gas. Uh, our import, we, uh, our trade with the, with the world is uh, 330 billion Qatari rial. Uh, and uh, it is a diversified uh, economy, as, as I mentioned, uh, supported by the Qatar Vision economy, uh, Qatar Vision 2030. Uh, all these indicators and the strength of the Qatars, uh, Qatar economy uh, give it some sort of uh, uh, resilient and, uh, and immune to, to deal with such situation. The blockage mainly is for the land border, land border uh, around 14% of our total trade. We have a clear plan of such a situation, if it happened, how we're going to deal with it immediately within hours. Uh, we activate this plan. The uh, alternative source is already identified and the alternative uh, point of entrance, like either by air or by sea, immediately diverted. And uh, uh, we are seeing the, the supply chain now uh, moving very smoothly. So people in Qatar were used to buying their milk and chicken produced from Saudi Arabia and brought here. Uh, now they're seeing it from other countries. You managed to change that, as you mentioned, in, in just a few hours. Can you explain how, uh, or uh, aside from these impacts, what other, has there been any other impacts or is, has the impact of the siege been very minimal? Uh, the impact of the, of the siege or the impact of, in the, eco of the, eco in the economy of Qatar was uh, very limited. And as I said, we have a clear plan and we know exactly how to deal with it. More than this, we built a, a reserve, a strategic reserve for the, the main uh, st strategic either food 
or also other materials uh, for our uh, project. Uh, that's why we, are, we were ready to deal with a, such a situation immediately within hours, immediately. Uh, this plan has been identified. The source uh, has been activated, the alternative source. And we start to import, you mentioned milk, uh, like immediately from Turkey and other sources. And uh, as you can see, the shelves was always full and never empty uh, after in the first day of the, um, of, the, of the blockage. We're really now not talking about uh, the, the primary need for the consumer. We are talking about maintaining the level of the lifestyle that Qataris and who live in Qatar experience. And that's where, where we are. We just uh, now, uh, I'm, today I'm talking to you, I'm comfortable that all the supply chain, either from air or by sea, is working as smooth uh, as, uh, as normal. The goods that used to go to Jebel Ali and uh, re-exported here to, to Qatar, either by sea again or by land, have been all, uh, have been all diverted to Sahar uh, and, uh, and, um, and uh, Salala. Uh, and uh, by the agreement with the main ship, ship lines. Also, we announced a direct, uh, a direct ship uh, from Salala and from Sahar to Hamad, uh, to Hamad port. Uh, more than this, uh, also, we have a new line coming directly, will come directly from India to Hamad port. So even what you are looking at, uh, the, the challenge that we are facing, creating opportunities, uh, for, for, the, for the others. You also, aside from having uh, one of the highest GDPs in the world, you have some of the biggest infrastructure projects that are taking place. You're gearing up to the World Cup 2022. There's a massive metro system that's being built. Has the siege had an impact on these big infrastructure projects? You know, all the, uh, all the infrastructure projects, either related to 2022 World Cup or related to the uh, actual plan infrastructure development and upgrade that we are doing here, talking about metro, highways, and others. All will be in schedule. There is no impact on it. Pri primary material, the main primary material is uh, some of them manufacture here in Qatar, like the cement, the steel, and uh, the, uh, the sand available here, and it's enough for Qatar, and even we, we export it. Uh, for uh, for the others, immediately, as I said, first of all, for the others, we, we have a reserve, a strategic reserve for mo more than a year. So if we really don't export or uh, import uh, for, uh, this primary material for a year, we have enough for all to cover all our projects, the infrastructure project and also the private sector pro uh, project, which is other projects. Uh, but uh, alternative source has been identified but the blockage for the primary uh, material, uh, primary uh, building material, has no impact because initially it was coming by sea, and now we're continuing. It's continuing now to come by sea, and Hamad Port now is working at its uh, full potential, uh, working smooth as a clock, uh, and uh, Hamad Airport and more than 150 destination is a, as per uh, schedule working uh, smoothly by Qatar Airways, except for the four countries that have the blockage uh, in Qatar. Otherwise, everything is moving like, uh, like clock. It appears that there's a few silver linings uh, when it comes to this, uh, this challenge or this, uh, the, the siege that's been imposed, that you've managed to turn some of these challenges into opportunities, like, for example, uh, the increase in trade that's come to Hamad Port, the new uh, naval or sea lines or s trade routes that as, have happened. As, Can you tell I me said, about them? As I said to you, I mean, the challenges create opportunities. And that's what we are seeing. And uh, f from what I see, I think the logistic landscape in the region is kind of changing now. Most of our goods and other country goods coming through uh, Oman, as I said, with agreement with the, um, uh, with the main ship, uh, ship liner. Uh, and uh, also a direct line start to come to Hamad port uh, from all around the, the world. Uh, and uh, and uh, also the source of goods also. We discovered a new source of goods that open up opportunity that we were not, probably the private sector were not aware of or exposed to it, but these challenges will, will give them this uh, new access to new market, to new goods and probably new quality. 
It's one of the world's fastest growing airlines and crucial to Qatar's efforts to become a transportation hub. Qatar Airways has posted massive profits for the financial year ending in March. But now the carriers had to scrap dozens of daily flights to Saudi Arabia, UAE, Bahrain and Egypt. And it has to take longer routes to avoid large parts of the Arabian Peninsula it's barred from. UAE-based carriers Itihad and Emirates may benefit in the short run, but analysts warn that fears of geopolitical instability in the region will hurt the global brand of all Gulf-based carriers. The UN's aviation body has been hosting talks in Canada to resolve the Gulf flight embargo. Qatar wants the ban to be declared illegal. Earlier, Al Jazeera's Andrew Simmons met with Qatar Airways Group Chief Executive Akbar al bakr He asked him about the company's latest results and its strategy to contain the current crisis. Uh, on a positive note, uh, let me to say that I'm delighted to announce uh, Qatar Airways profit of $541 million. It is a record profit uh, in the history of uh, our airline and at the same time we have also had a robust passenger number growth, 20.01% increase year on year, which again is one of the strongest growth figure uh, in our industry. So we are very resilient uh, as an airline. However, I do uh, agree that there are some dark clouds and I should not be hiding my concern that yes, uh, we will uh, underperform, but not to the extent of our neighbors because Qatar Airways has a very strong uh, growth uh, plan. Uh, you know that uh, not too long ago I announced that I was going to increase uh, 24 new destinations. I couldn't do it because I had capacity restraint. Now that we have released uh, capacity from the 18 destinations that uh, we have been barred illegally from operating, uh, we are now going to accelerate the other regions of the world uh, where we feel that uh, we will mitigate the, uh, the reduction in passenger numbers from these 18 destinations. Tell me this, let's just, just, just look back first of all, let's start chronologically, back to June the 5th, Monday morning, you were in Cancun, Mexico, major av aviation conference, word came through, I think you were quite late to hear, or a few minutes went by before you heard, and you heard what was it like? What was going through your head as you boarded that executive jet to fly straight back to Qatar? Well, uh, you know, uh, this is the last thing any CEO of an airline would want to hear, that the airspace in which it operates, international airspace in which it operates, has illegally been blocked. And I had to, of course, find my way out quickly. It was very difficult for me to find a way to come here quickly, but I did because uh, this is a call of duty. That's what I want to pick up on. We've heard of air wars. This transcends everything. Do you feel that in effect you're under attack? In fact, Qatar is under attack, being held to ransom, almost like being in a real war with an attempted siege going on. Well, it is. Uh, 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 Qatar is being economically uh, held at ransom. But you know Qatar is very resilient uh, for an airline. Uh, for us, the biggest priority is for us to have a gateway uh, in and out of my country, which we are very successfully uh, handling, and at the same time it is our passengers uh, for which uh, it is our responsibility. First, to reroute them, second, to give them a full refund if they chose to do so, and thirdly, that if they choose to travel on Qatar Airways, that we give them the highest amount of care that we give to our passengers. Uh, Qatar, is, uh, Qatar Airways is very strong uh, uh, financially. Uh, we will persevere and at the same time we will make sure that every single passenger is guaranteed that if it chose after booking on Qatar Airways not to travel on Qatar Airways, uh, we will give them uh, their refund. So they don't have any at all risk of losing their the, the, the money that they have invested in Qatar Airways. But let me tell you something, that as we are being affected, so our, our neighbors who have got into this illegal act in blocking us, their national carriers are also uh, uh, getting affected. What is also doing is letting 
the entire region's air connectivity confidence to be lost. So they are in the same basket. So they should not think that they'll be going laughing to the bank whilst they are putting economic pain on my country. Let, but tell me this though, give me an idea please of just what it means, the business in this region that you're losing because of these measures. Yes, we are losing nearly uh, uh, 22 to 25% of business in, in this region uh, because of the, uh, the blockade and the, the restriction on the 18 destinations I mentioned earlier. But as I said, Qatar Airways has other ways to, uh, to fill in this uh, void that has been created by these 18 destinations that we operated to. Still to come on Counting the Cost, tough talk from the European Union as a fractured election verdict leaves Britain struggling to frame its Brexit position. But first, the US Federal Reserve has raised interest rates by a quarter point to 1.25%. It's the fourth hike in 18 months. And it's signaled another hike is likely this year, indicating confidence in the state of the US economy. The unemployment rate is at its lowest in 16 years. Domestically, the rate hike will affect borrowers who will have to pay more on credit card debt. But this could also prompt investors to move money out of developing countries to earn more in the US. Fallen internet brand Yahoo is no longer a publicly traded company with Verizon completing its takeover. Its email and other digital services such as sports, finance and news will be part of a new Verizon subsidiary called Oath. The new company combines what's left of Yahoo and another internet pioneer AOL which was bought by Verizon two years ago. But Verizon's not getting Yahoo's prize stakes in two Asian internet companies, Alibaba and Yahoo Japan. They'll go to a newly formed company called Altaba. The chief executive of the ride-sharing app Uber says he'll take an indefinite leave of absence. Travis Kalanick's announcement follows an outside review into the company's controversial practices. Uber's been under increasing pressure over sexual harassment and allegations of an aggressive workplace culture. It's also accused of corporate espionage and using covert software to mislead government regulators. The review calls for changes to the board and more employee diversity. Well, it was meant to give Britain's Prime Minister Theresa May a stronger hand in upcoming Brexit talks with the European Union. But the snap election has left the ruling Conservative Party's majority in shambles. May had campaigned on a hard Brexit that would see Britain leave the EU and restrict immigration. But now she doesn't have a parliamentary majority. There are calls for a soft Brexit, which may allow Britain to stay in the common market with reduced rights. This would also maintain current rules for millions of EU nationals living and working in the UK. German Chancellor Angela Merkel has said that the EU wants to negotiate quickly and in the agreed time frame. The new French leader, Emmanuel Macron, is a vocal advocate of European integration, reducing Britain's room to manoeuvre. European officials are piling on the pressure, with the chief Brexit negotiator, Michel Barnier, saying, I can't negotiate with myself. For the European Perspective, I spoke to Swedish economist and writer Fredrik Eriksson. He's the director of the European Centre for International Political Economy, a world economy think tank based in Brussels. I began by asking him if he thought the UK election result would strengthen the EU's hands in negotiations. I think, most of all, that both those involved in the actual negotiations on the EU side, as well as the heads of governments, the prime ministers, the Angela Merkels, the Emmanuel Macrons, etc. I think they're going to find it extraordinarily difficult to negotiate with a country, with a government like the one in the UK right now, where it's not just that the hands has weakened, it's that we have a chaotic situation in the British Parliament where there's not going to be a majority for either form or outcome. And it's, it's difficult for all involved in negotiations to actually negotiate about something when you don't know what the outcome should be and whether that outcome actually can get the parliamentary approval. So I don't think they are happy or believe that their hands have been strengthened by the outcome of the British election. I think they are more fearful that this is a process which is about to collapse entirely. 
That is a very important point. So does that mean, according to your analysis there, then, that a softer Brexit is more likely? I wouldn't say so. I mean, I think the problem right now is that there is no majority for any form of Brexit outcome in the British Parliament. So we have uh, a Conservative Party who is going to remain in power with a weakened uh, Prime Minister, but one who is still beholden to the Bre Brexit headbangers in her own party. I don't think the Conservative Party itself is going to change its opinion. It but, wants but, to... Hang on for a second, Frederick. Then why do you think so many analysts are predicting that, that perhaps Theresa May's uh, government is going to be beholden to the uh, Brexit headbangers, and that means a softer Brexit is likely? Have they got it all wrong? No, I, I, th I think many of the commentators I'm seeing uh, I think practice wishful thinking more than anything else. Uh, I've seen a lot of commentary suggesting that the strong performance of the Labour Party in the election was actually sort of a sign that people wanted a softer Brexit. I'm not so sure about that at all. The Labour Party, after all, is a party that campaigned on actually leaving the single market, leaving the customs union, having immigration controls and not be under the sovereignty of the European Court of Justice. So we have 85% of the parliament is still made up of parties that uh, at least nominally want to take Britain to a hard Brexit. So with a, a good dosage of uh, political chaos, as you put it there, going on in the UK, what does that practically mean for specific Brexit issues? Is it going to be harder for the UK to push back on things like the so-called divorce bill, immigration control and so on? The big difficulty is will be that if Britain doesn't have its own idea where it wants to end up, what type of post-Brexit agreement that it wants to have with the EU, uh, it's going to be extraordinarily difficult to negotiate on any form of issue. The Brexit bill, citizen rights, uh, police, terrorism, uh, collaboration, etc. So we're going to see that Sort of despite the intention right now of the British government, which is to start the negotiations next week with uh, citizen rights type of issues, residence issues, uh, we're very soon going to sort of head into a situation where the British government needs to make up its mind what type of outcome it wants. And if it cannot make that decision, if it's tried to sort of delay it, uh, it means we're going to have all the other negotiations being stalled as well. All right, good to get your thoughts on that. Thanks so much. Thank you. Now, if you've ventured outside your mobile phone network's coverage area, you'll know roaming charges stack up pretty quickly. Now, the European Union is scrapping them for customers across the block. But consumer advocates are worried phone companies will try to claw back the charges in some other way. Ella Callan reports from Berlin. It's taken a decade, but finally, it's the end of mobile roaming charges in Europe. People in Europe can go on holidays or business trips without worrying about being hit with a big bill at home. We're not talking about 5 or 10 uh, euros. It's about 100 or 200 uh, euros. Mine's at 42 pounds at the minute, so... Is it? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I've been charged a lot, so hopefully it won't, it won't be any more. The new law is called Roam Like Home. It restricts the wholesale prices that phone companies can charge each other within Europe, savings that must be passed on to the consumer. This fulfills one of the big promises of European integration, a tangible benefit for people living in the EU. Wherever you travel, text messages, phone calls and data will cost the same as at home. The European Union says roaming charges have come down more than 90% since the law was first proposed in 2007. It's not so easy to just uh, abolish roaming uh, and uh, we had to apply some safeguards that uh, we won't crash uh, operators out of the market in some places where prices are cheap. But the new legislation isn't impressing the phone companies. Some estimates show they could lose millions of dollars in revenue. Depending on the telephone provider, roaming could make up to 10% of total revenue. We think there will be an attempt to make up the missing revenue in other ways. The EU says it's on the lookout for phone operators trying to undermine the rules by increasing other charges or upselling. Customers won't get away with indefinite roaming either. Carriers can charge extra fees if usage is mostly outside of home base. 
Phone users are advised to check their contracts for rules on roaming in non-EU countries, such as Switzerland and Andorra. In Britain, the ban may be short-lived. Free roaming is up for negotiation after Brexit. And that's our show for this week. You can get in touch with us by using the hashtag AJCTC when you do, or drop us an email. Counting the cost at aljazeera.net is our address. There's more for you online at aljazeera.com slash ctc. That'll take you straight to our page, which has individual reports, links, and entire episodes for you to catch up on. That's it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Sami Zaydan. On behalf of the whole team, thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.